Welcome to our, okay. So hello everybody, welcome to the virtual gardening class. And my name is Barbara Colley. I'm a water education instructor here at the Santa Clarita Valley Water Agency. And we present educational programs to K through 12, grades K through 12 in the Santa Clarita Valley. And uh, we've got a few informational slides to share with you before our main presenter, John Windsor. So the topic today is perennials and natives for the SCV. Okay, so now we are on Zoom, right? Uh, so you obviously know it is because you're here right now. And if you have any questions, there's the email address. I've put all of these relevant email addresses and web addresses in the chat session. So you should see that. Also, if you have any questions, uh, you can enter them into the Q&A portion and uh, the Q&A box is at the bottom, okay? So, um, and at the end, we will have uh, questions and answers. So uh, Santa Clarita Valley Water, we service these areas. Here's the boundaries that we cover here. And uh, so it's 195 square miles. So it's in all the Santa Clarita towns and also unincorporated areas. So uh, 74,000 customers and the total population is 273,000. And uh, the drought ready SCV, um, this, there's the website and that would be in your chat right there. And these are just things that we can do to save water as uh, residents of the Santa Clarita Valley and, and of California. So the idea is we'd like everyone to voluntarily reduce their water consumption and use by 15%. Example would be maybe fixing leaky faucets, checking the lawn irrigation system, because it is about 50% of our water use is inside and 50% is outside on our lawns. And we have rebates and um, so different ones such as a pool cover, lawn replacement, smart controller, and also a free water efficiency kit. And there's more information about that smart controller rebate. And again, that uh, web address is there in your chat. There's also a water smart workshop that you can do. And uh, this is a totally online course. And by finishing that, you get a $20 credit on your water bill. Lots of resources are available to you. So landscape resources, we have something from Better Homes and Gardens about uh, Southern California gardening tips. And then there's different tours and galleries of landscapes in the SCV and uh, just different things uh, to have hints. So this um, conservation tips for indoor and outdoor use. So we have a Facebook page, we have a Instagram, we have a Twitter and also a YouTube. And those are the ways to get to those. All right. And that's that. Okay, so now I am going to uh, turn it over to John. So John Windsor, he is a certified arborist and uh, California certified nursery man. He's been in the horticult horticultural advisor in Santa Clarita for the last 22 years and has a teaching credential in horticulture and teaches gardening at, uh, and landscape classes at the local adult school in Santa Clarita Department of Parks and Rec. So now I am uh, going to turn it over to John and I'm gonna stop this share and then start a new share with John's information. It's ready. Okay. 
So uh, folks, uh, welcome to the uh, webinar. And uh, so these plants that we're gonna be looking at today, they will all grow here, obviously in the SCV, and they are all water conserving or drought tolerant plants. So without having to tell you when we get to each and every plant, cause there's going to be a lot, we, we've got a lot of plants uh, on this particular presentation. So if you understand that they're all gonna be drought tolerant and we'll also say for the sake of argument that they are all for full sun. So what I will do as we go through these various plants is if any of them are not full sun, uh, then I will mention that. Uh, so if I don't say anything about the plant, we can just assume it's drought tolerant, takes full sun and should be very hardy. Okay, next. So we're gonna start with some plants that are very colorful and uh, durable. This particular one is very low. So if you want a very low plant to mix in or to put as a little border or in between rocks, uh, the armeria would be a very good choice. Next. And there's another picture of it. And uh, you can see from the information there that it blooms heavily in the spring and early summer, and then some blooms beyond that. Now you'll also notice that it says needs excellent drainage. That's also something that probably all of these plants would appreciate. In other words, if you have a heavy soil, if you feel you have a lot of clay in your soil, then you may want to amend it, add some loose material to it. Okay, next. And these are just some varieties of the same plant. Next. And Gallardia, this is a, uh, a plant from the Midwest, the Great Plains, uh, beautiful flower, uh, yellow. And, and it is a, a perennial. And what that means basically is that it's uh, gonna last more than one year. And uh, quite often, they reproduce from seed. Next, there's a close-up of the flower. And as you can see, there's several different varieties uh, varying from yellows, oranges, and reds. Next. Uh, here's a real tough plant, the red hot poker. You've maybe seen this around. Uh, when it's blooming, it's, it's really fantastic. And uh, talk about a durable, plant that you never have to do much to, this would be it. Next. And uh, you see there it says minimal winter soil moisture. That pretty much means you may not have to water it at all in the winter if we get any rain at all. Uh, now last year, probably would have wanted to water it about once a month. Okay, next. Here's a close up of the picture. Very pretty, and as you can see, it attracts the hummingbirds. Next. Uh, another grassy plant with a pretty flower on it, uh, kind of reddish. Uh, once again, once it's established, if you were to water it occasionally during the summer, it would continue uh, to bloom. Next. And there's a close-up of one just standing all by itself. Kind of pretty. And uh, you can see it's right by a roadway there and gravel around it. So that means that heat tolerant thing is for real. Okay, next. There's a close-up of the flower. Very pretty. And once again, yes, the hummingbirds like it. Next. Okay, and verbena. Oh, there's many... Uh, varieties of verbena. 
Uh, they're all quite pretty. And this particular one is, the, is a very tall one. Uh, I kind of like it. it it'll, you can plant it at the base of some uh, smaller shrubs and the, only the flowers will reach above it. Very nice. Also good in a rock garden. Um, kind of a, a, a neat plant. Next. And there's a close-up of the whole plant, but you can see how the, the actual uh, flowers are quite a bit higher than the plant. So it's, it's easy to kind of hide the plant and just enjoy the flowers. Next. Here's a close-up of those uh, flowers. And uh, I probably water mine about uh, once every two weeks during the summer. And it does well. Next. Here's a uh, California native, the uh, California fuchsia. And uh, if you go hiking much in the uh, local mountains, uh, you'll see this plant blooming in the uh, spring. Uh, so it, it's in almost all of the, if you go up to Towsley Canyon or any of the hiking places, uh, particularly if we get a wet spring, you'll see it blooming like crazy. Next. And there's a close-up of the flowers. And yes, once again, the hummingbirds love them. Okay, next. Yeah, we see a nice close-up. And uh, when it says good on hillsides, that's actually where you're gonna find it when you're up hiking. It'll almost always be coming out of the side of a hill, the side of a mountain, almost never just out on the flatlands. Okay, next. And here's your else. You've probably all seen this plant, uh, yellow daisy plant. Uh, just a tremendous uh, bloomer all the time. Uh, but all you have to do is uh, trim it back after every flush of blooms. Next. And there's a close up of the flower. Like I say, you cut it back a couple times a year. They're good for anywhere from three to five years. Uh, at that point, they get a little bit woody and you probably want to take them out and uh, replace them with a smaller plant. So when you do buy this plant, don't buy a full grown one, buy a relatively small one. That way you'll be able to enjoy it for uh, several years. Next. And there's a close up of the flowers. Like I say, very pretty plant, very common uh, and durable. Next. Another plant in the uh, chrysanthemum family, uh, different flowers. So you can see we can get some pinks and reds, etc. Uh, there's even a blue marguerite daisy. Uh, next. And there's a close up of the uh, flowers. Very pretty. You can uh, uh, grow them in containers. Uh, and uh, once again, some of these perennials are good for two to three years or so. Then they get a little woody, and you should take them out and, uh, and replace them. Okay. Next. And there's another marguerite daisy. Now, right now, if you go to the nurseries, you'll find chrysanthemums in full bloom. This is really... Uh, uh, the fall is a great time for chrysanthemums. Next. And there's the blue one, the blue marguerite daisy. And uh, it's a it's a low growing rounded plant. Uh, it doesn't need much trimming at all. Uh, if you want to deadhead it, that will encourage it to continue to plume. Next. Here's a close-up of it. And uh, you can see that dark green foliage that it really stands out nicely. And uh, once again, you can grow in a uh, container, can grow in a rock garden, or you can do a whole mass of them. And uh, it, uh, you can probably find a place uh, in almost any yard for this plant. Next. 
Here's a close-up of the flower. Next. Okay. Uh, status, or sometimes called sea lavender, limonium. You've probably seen this plant. It's uh, The plant itself is very low growing, but then it gets these huge clusters of purple and white flowers up above it. And uh, they make uh, good cut flowers, uh, bloom all the time. Uh, the plant itself is, once again, it's a perennial, so it's good anywhere from, once again, three to probably five years, at which point it'd just get too woody. You wouldn't like it, and you'd tear it out and replace it with another small one. Next. There's a close-up of the flower and the foliage. So the foliage itself doesn't get too terribly tall. Uh, the flower does. The flower will get up a two feet maybe even three feet above the plant. Uh, doesn't like cold weather. Wouldn't have been a problem last year, but uh, every once in a while we do get a cold winter. Next. And there's a close-up of that flower. Like I say, very pretty. And you can cut that flower and use it in flower arrangements. It lasts a very long time. Next. And this plant you've probably seen before, Dusty Miller. It's a way of getting some gray foliage into uh, your garden that may have an awful lot of green in it. Now, the flowers themselves, uh, my, a lot of people consider them to be a distraction to the plant because it, you really plant it for its silver foliage. Next. And there you get a good shot of that silver foliage. That's, that's really what you plant, use the plant for. And you see there it says thrives on neglect, but demands once again the well-drained the well -drained soil. Next. And there's a picture of the flower, which like I said, a lot of people just cut that flower off just to enjoy the uh, gray foliage or silver foliage. Next. Okay, hookera. Now here's a uh, plant, coral bells, of which there are dozens and dozens of variety. Now, I told you that I would make note or let you know if any of these plants wasn't well adapted to full sun all day. So I think I will make a little note about this plant here. It uh, does well. Uh, underneath trees, does well in rock gardens, does well with some protection from the hot afternoon sun. Uh, next, there is a picture of the, the flowers, which thus give it the name coral bells, but the foliage is just very nice. It's a small rounded shrub, and the foliage can come in dozens of different colors. Next. That's a dark green foliage there, but it also comes in purple foliage, red foliage, pink foliage, large leaf foliage, and tiny leaf foliage. So you plant it mostly for the foliage. Next. And here's a uh, plant that many of you have probably seen. Now, this particular one, the picture, is of the Myri, oftentimes called the foxtail fern. This plant will grow well in containers. It will grow well outside in the ground. It looks a little nicer if it's given some protection from the hot afternoon sun. Now, there is another variety called the Springeri. Uh, don't plant that one. Don't plant that, the other one for any reason. Uh, that one can be a bit invasive and very difficult to eradicate. This particular variety here, the Myri, is not a problem at all. It stays put, it doesn't spread, and uh, needs very little care. Next. There's the uh, other variety, the one that uh, spreads out. And uh, I would caution against planting that. It uh, has thorns. It's difficult to eradicate. Uh, 
just just avoid it. There's plenty of really good plants. Next. And uh, this is uh, at the bottom there, you'll see one called retrofraxis. That one grows almost like a vine. Uh, so it will grow upright on a trellis or something of that nature. It makes good cut foliage. However, be careful. It does have thorns. Uh, I grew it one time to use the foliage, but uh, I don't think I'd use it again. Uh, the thorns are well hidden in there. And when you're cutting it and using it uh, for floral arrangements, uh, you'll find out about those thorns. Next. Okay, Coreopsis. Now the Gallardia that we saw earlier is, uh, is a, uh, another native to the uh, Midwest, the Great Plains, as well as uh, this one here, the Coreopsis. Uh, so obviously they're gonna just take all the heat and sun that you can give it. And uh, once again, cutting back the uh, dead flowers uh, might be all you have to do to this plant. Next. And there's a close-up of the uh, flowers. Once again, there's a couple different varieties of this plant. Uh, almost always the flowers are yellow and the uh, foliage changes a little bit. Some are a little uh, shorter, more compact. Some have uh, interesting looking foliage. Next. So there's a uh, close-up of a uh, flower on the Coreopsis. Very pretty plant, very durable. Next. So salvias. Now here's a plant that uh, I think you're very familiar with. And uh, I think everybody should have at least one or two varieties of salvia in their yards. Uh, the hummingbirds love them. Uh, and the butterflies, but and the bees, and the birds, everybody seems to like this plant. Blooms for a very long period of time. Uh, you can prune it down in early spring and it'll shoot right back up on you. Uh, there's many different varieties. This particular one here, the red one, uh, I've grown it and from the minute it begins to flower until it begins to die back in December, I had hummingbirds to it every day. Uh, next. There's a uh, picture of one of the uh, Mexican varieties. They have uh, bluer flowers, completely different foliage. Um, and some can be huge. Uh, they can range anywhere from four feet to six feet just in one year. And then you cut it back down to the uh, ground in the winter. Next. And uh, so the uh, Salvia gregei, or oftentimes called the autumn sage, uh, that's the one that uh, I think you'll enjoy if you like having hummingbirds around. They seem to like the uh, red flowers, but there's also pink and lavender, and a whole array of colors. Next. Okay. Now, Columbine, I'm sure you've all heard of that. And uh, uh, once again, native to the uh, Midwest. Here in California, uh, we find that this plant does a little bit better with some of that afternoon shade. Uh, so other than that, it, uh, it should be fine if we get a cold winter. Uh, sometimes it will just die down to the ground, but uh, comes back again in the spring. Next, here's a close up of the picture of the uh, flowers, very pretty. And uh, they kind of hang upside down, uh, but a lot of the uh, bumblebees and hummingbirds and things like that. Next. And here's one growing kind of wild in a rock garden. And uh, 
they they can uh, they can grow in in surprising places, poor soil, uh, everything of that sort. Uh, so very durable. Next. And of course, everybody knows about these guys, the lily of the Nile. And uh, once again, a couple different varieties. There's a dwarf that uh, is 18 inches tall to the standard one, which can get uh, four feet tall. And uh, if you like them, you like them. Uh, not much to say about it. You can dig them up every few years and divide them because they continue to grow bigger and bigger from the base. Next. There's a close-up of the dwarf there, and you see the flowers rising above it. So in June, it'll give you some flowers. But that's it. That's the only time it'll flower is in June. So for 11 months, you're looking at the green plant. And in June, you get to watch the flowers bloom. Next, there's a close-up of the uh, flowers, but I think most of you have seen this plant. And uh, like I said, uh, if it's something you like, once you plant one, you'll have it forever. Next. Okay, and daylilies. Daylilies are probably a little more interesting than the agapanthus because uh, for one thing, they bloom for a longer period of time. Uh, secondly, uh, you get some different colors, yellows, oranges, and reds. And there are dwarf varieties where the plant stays quite low, uh, but the flowers come up above them. Next. There's a close-up of just one single plant growing by itself. And uh, so there are evergreen and deciduous varieties. The deciduous varieties in a cold winter will pretty much disappear and then come back up in the spring. And uh, it's not a bad idea to cut them back anyway in the uh, late spring or, or, I'm sorry, late winter, early spring. Next. There's a little dwarf one going all by itself there. And you can see the yellow flower is quite pretty. Next. Now, these are, uh, this is a grass here. This one is the purple fountain grass. And there's different varieties, once again, a uh, dwarf and a regular one. Uh, if you cut it back, it comes back quite nicely and will get you that red foliage that you like with the uh, plumes. Uh, next slide. And here's what, uh, an individual plant looks like. If you don't cut it back, uh, then you'll get the old yellow foliage mixed in with the new red one. And that won't look quite as nice. Uh, some of these varieties, like the red ones, are pretty good. They won't uh, set seed, they won't spread. But uh, don't plant the green varieties. I, I, I would hope that most nurseries won't sell them. Next. And there's a picture of the foliage up close. And next. Deities. Uh, once again, here's a plant that if you put it in the ground, you will have it forever. And it's like an amoeba. It continues to grow and grow and grow and soon takes over the entire yard. Next. It's got a, a white uh, flower with some coloration in it. Uh, it'll never die. And you'll have a very difficult time removing it if you uh, so desire. Next. Landscapers love to put it in because it is tough. I mean, if you forget to water it, it's not gonna die. If you overwater it, probably not gonna die. If you feed it, probably not gonna die. If you never feed it, it won't die. Uh, so landscapers like to put it in because the customer will never complain about it dying. Next. And Lirio. Uh, so if I could draw your attention back to a plant that we looked at earlier, the uh, coral bells. And I mentioned that uh, 
it does best with uh, some shade, especially the uh, hot afternoon sun. This is another plant that mixes quite well with the uh, coral bells. It's a grassy plant. Once again, different varieties, several different varieties. Some of them only a foot tall, some of them two feet tall, some with variegated leaves, uh, some with very dark green leaves. Uh, so very striking uh, plants. Uh, next. There's a close-up of the foliage. Uh, the variegated foliage is uh, kind of neat. It's got a red, I'm sorry, a green and white stripe. Or you can get a very, very dark green variety. Flowers are generally blue, but they do have some white ones. Okay, next. And there's another close-up. And here's a list of some of the... Uh, the ones, uh, Silver Dragon with the white stripe, Sunproof with a gold edge, Big Blue with dark green foliage, etc. So many varieties, and uh, give them just a little bit of shade, they perform very nicely. Next. And there's a uh, dwarf mondo grass, which is related to the lyrio that we just saw, but it stays very low. Uh, you can grow it like a, almost like a lawn. It never needs to be mowed. Uh, and it prefers a little more shade. So if you have areas where you can't grow grass because it's too shady, uh, Mondo might be a, a good alternative. Next. And there's a close-up of it. So it's a small green clumping plant. Uh, yeah, just tough as nails. Uh, not much I can say about it, except it is a good turf substitute in uh, shady areas. Next. And a couple different varieties. So yes, there are some var variegated varieties and some varieties with very dark foliage and a dwarf one that's very low, three to four inches. Very neat. Next. And society garlic. I think uh, most of you have seen this, uh, certainly smelled it. Uh, it's got the pink flowers above the green foliage. And uh, this plant can be easily separated. You can plant one plant and in a couple of years, dig it up and make 10 plants out of it and they will all survive. Next. Pretty, pretty purple flower. Uh, yeah, see what it says there? Uh, avoid planting close to the house or the entrance uh, because yes, it is fragrant. If you like to have the smell of garlic on your shoes and your pants and your hands for weeks on end, this plant is for you. Next. And once again, couple uh, newer varieties, some with variegated leaves, some with white flowers, uh, all with the same fragrance. Next. Guara, here's a, a very interesting plant uh, native to Texas. Uh, there's at least three varieties. Uh, this one here, the wand flower, has the tallest flowers, sprawling plants with pink, white, or red flowers. Um, Give them room, uh, very pretty, uh, can spread a bit. Uh, next, there's the uh, dwarf, beautiful little plant, the deep pink flower, uh, doesn't get too big, two feet or so, so it doesn't sprawl quite as much as the other varieties. But uh, once again, thrives on neglect, next. Siskiyou pink, that's, that's the one with the pink foliage and pink flowers. And then there's a couple other uh, varieties that they've come up with. Uh, all of them very neat, very neat. Uh, but give them a room, give them room because they do like to sprawl and spread out. Next, Virginia. Uh, you won't see this one too much unless you uh, visit somebody's shade 
garden. So here's a plant that definitely wants the shade. Also wonderful in a container. Has a big heart-shaped leaf, big foliage, and then a pink flower. Next. There's a picture of the uh, foliage, and it's called Heartleaf Virginia for just that reason. Excellent under trees. Um, and like I say, it does need shade. Uh, regular watering. So this is a little different than most of the other plants we've talked about. Next. Here's a close-up of the flower. Very pretty. So most yards have a small shady section. So uh, this might be the uh, plant to put in that area. Next. Now, Mexican evening primrose. Uh, I just want you to read that very bottom line there. Okay, for those of you that are having trouble reading it, I'll tell you what it says. Vigorous growing ground cover that can be invasive. I don't even know if they need to say can be. They could just say is invasive. Next. Pretty pink flower. So it tempts people to plant it. And uh, Another one of these plants, think long and hard before you plant it. You really wanna, you really wanna have this plant because once you do, you may never get rid of it. Next, here it is. You can see it just fills every space it can get. Uh, I've seen people that had areas where they could use it because they didn't water or uh, it was uh, just open area, so they didn't care if it spread. But in our uh, small gardens, if we want a well-kept garden, this would not be a welcome addition. Next, Artemisia. Another way to get some pink, I'm sorry, some gray, gray foliage into the garden. So we saw the Dusty Miller earlier, and uh, this one, the Artemisia, is uh, a nice plant. Uh, we have some natives uh, that grow up in the mountains uh, that are members of this family, and uh, they're very fragrant, uh, very pretty, very soft plants. Uh, uh, they can be cut back every year, and they come right back up uh, so a real, real nice way to get some contrast, color contrast in the garden. Next. There's a, a small one right there. And uh, it uh, does seem to be rabbit resistant. In other words, they don't care much for it. Uh, good drainage, poor soils. I mean, if it grows up in the mountains, you know it's not too fussy about the soil. Next. And there's a close-up of the foliage and uh, some different varieties. Some are uh, very tight and low to the ground and some get quite big. And, uh, but like I say, very, very pretty foliage and very soft foliage and a nice fragrance. Next, my aporum. Here's a uh, ground cover uh, that's often used as a lawn substitute or on a hillside. Uh, where it can cover a hill and prevent erosion. It's uh, good as a lawn substitute because it doesn't need to be mowed, doesn't need to be watered as much, very little care, doesn't need to be fertilized. So a lot of advantages to growing this plant. Next. And uh, there's a close up of a uh, upright, variety that uh, we don't grow too much out here. We mostly grow the ground cover type. Next. Okay. Uh, here's another picture of the uh, upright varieties. They tend to be more frost sensitive. The uh, ground cover can take the cold weather and come back quite nice. Uh, this one doesn't uh, 
react as well when it gets cold. Next. Acacia, good uh, on a slope. You maybe see these growing by the freeways, etc. Australian native, just uh, tough as nails. Uh, just put it in the hottest, driest spot in the yard and it'll thrive. Next. The gray foliage and yellow flowers, kind of pretty, requires no maintenance. Uh, next. And there's a close up of the uh, yellow flowers. All the acacias get you some yellow flowers. Uh, low boy and desert carpet are two varieties that are used as uh, ground covers uh, because they're relatively low and easy to grow. Next. Now, this is an Asian jasmine. Uh, doesn't have the aroma of the star jasmine but is much lower growing and uh, makes a pretty good ground cover. Uh, I've seen this grow in areas that were partly sunny, maybe morning sun or filtered sun. And it's very attractive, very neat. Green all year with a shiny leaf. Next. And doesn't bloom as much, but uh, there's a close up of the bloom. Next. And there it is as a low growing ground cover. Next. Now, germander. This is in a uh, family that includes tucrium, it includes oregano, and uh, several uh, herb plants that uh, you maybe have heard of marjoram. Uh, they're all in the same family, and they're all very durable. Uh, this one has some uh, pretty flowers to it. There's varieties that stay very low. There's some that get up to a foot tall. Uh, they make a great ground cover. Uh, next, here's a close-up of the uh, flowers. Uh, so uh, kind of neat. Uh, Underused, I would say, underused plants. So this could be in the forefront and you could have taller plants behind it. Next. Another close up of the flowers. Next. Okay, a yarrow. Most of you are probably familiar with yarrow. And uh, it can be a, a great plant. You can, there are some varieties you can use as a ground cover or lawn substitute. Some varieties, you can even mow them. Uh, just make sure that you get the right variety. Next. Uh, some varieties spread quite a bit, and some people would consider them to be invasive. Uh, you should cut them back at least once a year. They do like hot, sunny areas. Uh, and uh, if you cut off the old flowers, they look a little bit better. Next, here's a close-up of the uh, foliage. So kind of pretty foliage. And like I said, there's, there's many different types of uh, yarrow. Make sure you choose the right one for your location. Next. Coyote bush, uh, still available. Not quite the rage it was 20 years ago or so when, uh, when we had the a tremendous drought. Uh, it's a it's a native, and uh, it's uh, it's just green. Uh, makes a good ground cover, perhaps on slopes in sunny, dry areas. Next, but uh, like I said. Just green and very tough though, very tough. So if you just wanted to fill in some space with a, a drought tolerant, sun loving plant, this would be a good choice. Next, uh, there's a picture of the flowers and uh, there are some different varieties. Pigeon Point and Twin Peaks are, are some varieties that will uh, make uh, better ground covers. Next. 
Uh, Calicoli. These are pretty little plants. Uh, they're uh, they look a lot like a succulent. They uh, got uh, attractive foliage, pretty flowers, and they do well in containers. Uh, they can also go outside in the garden. I uh, probably give them a little bit of uh, shade from the afternoon sun. Next, and there's a picture of them without the uh, the flowers on them. But they're great little plants, real tough, and uh, like I said, they're great in containers or hanging baskets. Next, here's a close up of the flower. So very pretty flower, and. Uh, they, uh, they have hybridized it uh, to produce other types of other colors in the flowers too. Next, Echeveria, another real pretty little succulent. Uh, this particular one is called hens and chickens. Excellent, excellent in a uh, container, uh, excellent in the ground. And you can take one of those little plants off and start a new plant from it very easily. Next. And there's a close-up of one in a container. Uh, once again, you plant this in a in a cactus mix, and they'll do quite well with the infrequent watering. Next, and there's a picture of the uh, the flower, and uh, there's this some more uses for it: a ground cover, containers, rock gardens, uh, just about anywhere you want to put this plant. Next. And Dudleya, another uh, native uh, plant that uh, I have seen uh, when I'm hiking on steep hillsides and cliffs. Uh, very neat uh, looking little plant. Uh, once again, grow it in a container or in the ground with fast drainage, relatively dry soil. Next, here's a uh, close up, very pretty little plant. Uh, it will produce a little flower spike. That's uh, kind of nice. And uh, once again, great in, in a succulent garden or cactus garden or rock garden. Next. And there's a close up of a couple of them. Uh, using California natural areas uh, because it is a uh, native. Go ahead, next. Crassula. Everybody knows the jade plant. You should know this plant. It's a very common California plant, uh, grows like crazy. And uh, you can uh, take a piece, stick it in the ground and grow a new plant. Next, does well in containers and you can break it off if it gets too big or cut it back and uh, put it in the ground if you want. It'll be there for a long time. Next, and occasionally it will bloom. And uh, there's uh, new varieties, and uh, most of them look best with uh, at least a half a day sun. If you want to give them some shade, make it from the hot afternoon sun. Next, wisteria. Okay, I think you know this plant too, with its pretty flowers that hang down in bunches, typically purple or blue but there are some uh, red, pink, and white varieties. And uh, they will take a while to bloom, but once they bloom for you, they will bloom for you every year. Next, there they are. You can see how pretty that is. Uh, be real careful on the pruning. Uh, only prune right after the flowering. Sometimes pruning in the winter cuts off some of the uh, wood that would produce flowers the following year. Okay. Uh, phosphorus will help it to continue to bloom, although it is not a plant that needs much nitrogen. So as a rule, avoid fertilizing and avoid watering too much. Uh, sometimes they don't bloom if they are given regular water and regular food. Next, there's a 
pretty picture of uh, one of the purple ones hanging down from an arbor. Okay, next. It, here's another vine called cat's claw. And it is called that because as it grows, it literally does produce these little attachments that have claws on them and they'll stick to anything and that allows the plant to hold on to stuff as it grows up. Uh, yellow flowers in the spring, very durable plant. Next. And it can also be grown on the ground as a ground cover. It takes as much heat as you can give it in any type of soil. Next. Another vine with yellow flowers, but it does not have the uh, claws of the, uh, the previous plant. So this one here, you probably do want to attach it to get it going. And uh, very nice plant, uh, blooms best in sunny areas and uh, blooms best in the spring. Next. Then there's a close up of the flower, very pretty flower. Um, once established, doesn't need much water and just about any kind of soil. Next. And there's a pretty picture of one off a fence there. Next. Another vine. This one comes from Australia with. Uh, what's neat about it is it blooms very early in the season with these purple flowers. So most people will mix this with another vine because this vine probably be all done blooming by mid to late March. So then you'd just be looking at green foliage. Next. And that's really what you want to see in the flowers. So if you were to mix that with another vine that perhaps blooms uh, in the spring or summer, then uh, that way you'd be able to uh, take advantage of these late winter, early spring blooms on the Hardenbergia. Next. Another jasmine, this one here is the uh, pink jasmine. Uh, extraordinarily fragrant, starts to bloom pretty early, sometimes late January, certainly throughout February and March. Uh, overpowering fragrance, I would call it. Next. There's a picture. That's why it's called pink jasmine. The flowers are actually white, but the buds are pink. Uh, Put it back right after it flowers uh, because the plant can look a little messy if you uh, leave the dead flowers on it. Next. And that's a uh, variety of the plant that has some uh, variegation to it. Next. Uh, trumpet vines, once again, several different varieties of uh, trumpet vines. Uh, this particular one has a deep red trumpet, and now it blooms from late spring to early summer. Uh, next, there's a pretty picture of the foliage, very neat foliage, uh, and the bud's just beginning here. And like I say, there are some different uh, varieties with different flowers. Next, there's a close-up of a red one. Beautiful. And there's purple flowered ones too. Very nice vines. Next. And ficus, creeping fig. You've probably all seen or heard of this plant. Uh, it'll attach to stucco or block walls. Uh, can be invasive. Also, if you're trying to garden in front of it, the roots and the plant itself will come out towards the garden. So 
You see this location right here, there's almost no place for it to grow, but upright. So that's what it's doing. But uh, given its druthers, it would, uh, it would come out into the garden or out into the street. Next, there's a close up of its juvenile leaves. The uh, leaves, very small like this when they're young. But as it matures, the leaves get quite large and it actually will produce a uh, three inch long oblong fruit. Next. And there's a close up of some of the bigger leaves as it gets uh, more mature. Next. Did we run out of slides? Yes. Very good. Okay, I think we probably have some uh, questions from the audience now. All right, questions from the audience. All right. So first question is, uh, Zauschneria, California, can it take direct full sun? Uh, typically, when I see it growing up in the mountains, it's growing on the side of a hill where it would only get half a day sun, sometimes underneath oak trees. So I would say no. I would say it would be best uh, on a slope or under a tree where it would get uh, half a day sun or filtered sun. Okay. Uh, these plants that take little maintenance, do they slough off at their base? In other words, do they need hand picking versus raking the base? Oh, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I've got several of these plants myself. I don't rake at all. I, I, I uh, dread the man that uh, invented the rake. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay, can you recommend how to get rid of the bad kind of asparagus fern? Uh, yeah, dig and sift through the soil. In other words, dig it up, get yourself a... Uh, garden flat or some sort of sifter and sift out all those little round balls. Uh, and then tell everybody you know to never plant that plant. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how does one prune Coreopsis to make it bushy? Well, Coreopsis is gonna do what it wants to do uh, as far as the size of the plant. And since you're only gonna have it, yeah, maybe three years or so, uh, when it just gets to where you don't like the size of it anymore, just take it out, plant a new smaller one. So the trimming that you give it would be mostly a deadheading it. You can take a little bit of the foliage off when you do that and that'll be fine. All right. And then how does salvia respond to less sun northern exposure during winter? And not well at all, <laughs> not well at all. Uh, that plant really does uh, like the sun. And if you have an area of the yard that is going to be shaded all winter long, you're probably not going to be terribly happy with the salvias. Maybe some of the other plants we uh, uh, talked about would be better in that location. Uh, I've planted and grown uh, several varieties of uh, salvia, and they've all performed best in the sun. And then who is Wheeler Company? Oh, Wheeler. Uh, that's, a, that's Tim Wheeler. He's, he's my boss. He's the fellow that puts these presentations together. He's a great horticultural mind. And uh, he works for the uh, various water agencies. Uh, just a, a wonderful fellow. And Wheeler Company is uh, the invention of Tim Wheeler. All right. Okay. I find my front yard plants struggle in the summer. I only plant full sun plants, but it seems like the flowers portion of the plant will burn up. Are there any recommendations on how to prevent this? I've planted African lily, geraniums, petunia, and viney lantanas, and they all have burnt up and I water them daily. <laughs> okay. That's a long one. Uh, okay, no, that's fine. Uh, but the last sentence was the important one. Why, why would you water these plants daily? Um, we, at the beginning of this program, I, I, I mentioned these plants are drought tolerant. Um, so yes, if you're going to water a geranium or a lantana or any of those plants daily, of course, the, the, no, they will not perform well at all. And they're not burning. It has nothing to do with the sun. It has to do with excessive watering. If you water lantana 
more than once a week, truly you're wasting water, uh, truly. Uh, uh, and geraniums, the only time I would water them more than once a week is if they were in a container and then I might water them every five days. So yeah, watering your plants excessively uh, is doing them harm. It's not the sunlight burning the flowers, it's the uh, excessive water. And plants also pick up the root rots and then they perform poorly. So uh, the idea of drought tolerant plants is uh, that they don't need to be watered daily. Uh, plants that get watered daily would be plants that originated in the rainforest. And we don't grow any of those. We don't grow rainforest plants here. I can remember my little side note here. My mother went to Costa Rica and she sent me back a, a postcard from a rainforest there in Costa Rica. And she says, John, you won't believe this. They get some form of rain, some rain, 350 days out of the year. And I said, mom, you won't believe this. Here in Valencia, where I live, they water 365 days out of the year. <laughs> and there you go. There you go. <laughs> okay, is there a rattlesnake deterrent? Uh, uh, well, they don't like strong fragrances. Uh, cedar mulch is good. As far as plants, I have heard that rosemary and sages are good, but rosemary especially because it produces a, a, a strong fragrance and an oil. And the way it works is that any of these things that give off these oils uh, when it's hot and sunny out, uh, it, it tricks, it tricks uh, snakes that are going after the heat of a rodent. So if a rodent were to run into rosemary, then the snake would have a difficult time finding it. So uh, that's about all I'll say about that. And, and they do make some repellents for snakes. Uh, and these are usually made out of cedar wood or castor oil or things with very strong fragrances uh, so that the snake can't uh, smell its, its prey. Next. Okay. Can you give more information on cat's claw, the origin on the slope, also how to get rid of morning glory? Okay, well, uh, cat's claw on a slope is fine if you have a wide open slope and uh, you don't mind something just completely taking over, okay? Uh, Cat's claw will grow on almost anything. So if it's a chain link fence or if it's a block wall, it will grow up it. And, uh, you know, some people might consider that to be a bit invasive. Okay. Now on morning glory, well, it's just one of those doggone plants that uh, I try to warn people about. I've warned you about asparagus fern. I warned you about the other uh, uh, plant previously in the slides. I think the Mexican evening primrose. Uh, some plants are simply uh, very invasive. Some plants are simply good, probably shouldn't be grown. Uh, morning glory is, or used to be, not quite the problem because we had colder winters. Cold winters knock the morning glories down. Uh, so areas like closer to the coast and in the Santa Monica Mountains where they, where they don't get frost. The morning glory can be an incredible weed. We don't plant them too much here, but if you did, you'd have trouble eradicating it because after a while it develops a tuber like a potato underground. And you might kill off everything that's above ground and then next spring up would come one of those little vines again. So do I have good advice? A spray spray them with uh, an herbicide. It's probably better than cutting them down because perhaps the herbicide could travel through the foliage and down into that tuber underground. Okay. okay. What is the name of the invasive ground covering plant that has little round hard seeds and have sharp thorns on them? And how can you eradicate them? They are terrible on my pet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, that, that's actually a... Uh, a weed, not a ground cover. 
but it does spread like that. Uh, it's got a different names. Goat's head is uh, one name they give it. Puncture vine is the most common name they give it. And yeah, it's uh, something I remember as a kid. You didn't want to go barefoot through fields that had puncture vine in it. You also didn't want to ride your bike through it. Um, yeah, that it's terrible. And those those little balls, those little goat's heads, uh, that's actually the seed. So when they get caught up in your bicycle tire or your shoes or your dog's paws, that's how it spreads. And uh, yes, can take over large areas. Dreadful plant. If you take it out when it's small, it's very easy to remove when it's small. Just be very aware of those thorny balls on it when you're removing it. Uh, not much other advice I can give to you except remove them, remove them, remove them. Okay. What is a good plant for a south facing front yard that gets a lot of direct full sun? Yeah, 97% of the plants we just saw. <laughs> uh, basically, I think I only mentioned maybe four plants out of that whole presentation uh, that didn't want late afternoon sun. But if you wanted me to just give you three right off the top of my head, I'd say rosemary, lavender, and sage. Okay. Um, what is a good flower for a bank that bunnies won't eat? I think we saw a couple of them during the presentation. And uh, the three that I just mentioned uh, have a lot of oils in them. Basically herbaceous plants, herb plants. Uh, you might consider lavender to be an herb or rosemary or sage. Uh, plants like that. Uh, there was another one, where, one of the gray plants, I think the artemisia also said that it was fairly rabbit proof. Uh, I don't think they care much for lantana uh, and the way lantana grows so vigorously, even if they did eat it, it'd probably come back pretty well, okay? And uh, should you grow lantana near huckleberry? Or sorry, not huckleberry, honeysuckle. Okay, there you go. Yeah, I don't think yeah, we have huckleberries the, out here. The follow-up was, oops, honeysuckle, not <laughs> huckleberry. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know why it would matter. Uh, honeysuckle is very vigorous. Uh, once again, honeysuckle is a sprawling, vining type plant. So I would think if there was any problem with that, it might be that it might cover up the uh, lantana. Because remember, lantana, even though it can get quite big, certainly wouldn't consider it invasive and could be easily trimmed. Uh, whereas honeysuckle, that, that's just the nature of the beast is that it wants to run and grow. So it might, so uh, physically, that might be the only reason not to have them near each other is that one might crowd out the other. Okay. All right, so that's all of the questions. Yeah. And uh, thank you very much, uh, John, for all this good information that you gave us today. Okay. And next month, it's going to be uh, maintaining a sustainable landscape. That's gonna be uh, November 13th, November 13th at 9 a.m. Okay, I'll be here. <laughs> all right, good. <laughs> Okay, uh, no more questions from the, uh, the audience? Then I will say thank you. Thank you for uh, joining us on the webinar. And uh, uh, make sure you contact the people at SCV Water and tell them we want to be back live again soon. A <laughs> <laughs> little pressure there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All, right. All right. All right. Okay, bye-bye then. Bye-bye.